you shall be saved, right? Amen. If you, in this case, the warning goes forth, this is a situation, if you don't take heed to my, my warning, you shall die. There's no way out of it. There's no hope at this time. As far as, you know, I'm not talking about spiritual salvation, but as far as your life on this earth, he shall die in his iniquity. I want you to see those two elements. The warning, God is merciful, so he gives the warning, but then you also see that he is not a God that budges when it comes to justice. The imperative statement, you shall die. I want you to go now to 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. Chapter number 36, verse number 16. Chapter number 36, verse number 16. That is now to the, to the left in your Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter number 36, verse number 16. I'm going to show you this portion of God's character that is very often ignored. It's not understood. You should underline this in your Bible. I have this underlined in my Bible. I want you to look at what takes place again. Look at, at let's begin reading. Let's get the context. Verse number 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up, be times, that means early, and sending. Because why? Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Watch this. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets. Notice there are multiple people that are sent here. They are given multiple opportunities. I want you to look very carefully at the next words. I'm going to reread the last statement. And misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. Underline this right here. Till there was no remedy. Does anyone know in here, or everyone know, what the word remedy means? It means help. Hope, if you will, in this case. What does God say? He gave them opportunities. I sent my messengers. I sent my prophets. I sent my, you know, all of those people preaching my word. They went and they preached to you and they warned you what was going to come. Because why? Because he's compassionate. Don't say, oh, this is not talk. You know, God is not the God of mercy now. No, God is both. God is not a robot. God is, a, he's, he's real. He has mercy and he has wrath, just like you do. We are made in God's image in a lot of different ways. Okay, we, God made us in his image so that we can communicate with him, so that we can have a relationship with him, so it makes sense that you would be exactly like him. People want to make God into this robot where he's only love. You just, you just love constantly. That's not the God of the Bible. That's right. It's not the God of the Bible. You know what he did? He had compassion on them. And because he loved them, he warned them beforehand about what was going to come. Because he loved them, he sent his prophets, he sent his messengers multiple times. Isn't that clear of the implication here? He gave them multiple warnings because of their wickedness. But do you know what happened? They mocked the messengers. They refused to hear the word of God. And then it says that the wrath of the Lord arose. And then it says this, think about this concept, till there was no remedy, till there was no remedy. Let me explain that to you in our terms. At this point, there was nothing they could do. It was too late. There was no remedy at this point. He gave them opportunities. He gave them chances to repent. He gave them messengers that came and warned them. And what did they do? They mocked and they didn't care. And now there is no remedy. There is no help. There is nothing you can do. There's nothing that you can say at this point. There's no remedy. That is the God of the Bible. Amen. That is the God of the Bible. God is a just God. And there comes a time when you have to pay that punishment. <clears throat> And you know what? You can keep going down that path in your life. You can keep going down, you know, uh, the, the, the life of sin and committing transgressions. And you know what happens oftentimes? Because you don't receive that punishment, you don't repent. Because you don't receive, you know, that punishment immediately, you just continue to sin. But you know what? Oftentimes when the punishment comes, it's too late in your life. When, when the judgment is there and you're standing before the judge and you're begging for mercy, you've already committed the crime. It's too late. You've had the warnings. That was when you should have repented. You know what that does? It also shows the power of God's word, too, and how we should revere God's word. Amen. How do we receive the warnings? Well, from a preacher from the pulpit and then reading those warnings in, in your Bible. Right. That is your warning. Amen. 
That's the importance of, hey, you better pick up your Bible and read it. You better know what you should and shouldn't be doing in life. The sins that, that God just doesn't put up with, and they're not all the same. There are certain sins where, where God subscribes different penalties and different punishments. But understand, please understand God's character in your, in your life. You need to understand who he is. He is not a pushover. He is not a joke. He is not. He is much more firm than, than the judges of humanity. Right. Because he knows perfect justice. And you will eventually pay for it. And there, comes a, there, can, there can come a time in your life when God looks at you. What a scary place to be. When God looks at you and he says, you get no more opportunities. None. I'm done. Think about that. Think about the day of judgment. Think about when literally billions of people are standing before God. Picture that, really. They're standing before him, and there, there are going to be people. These are real people. They're going to be acting in different ways. Some people are going to be screaming more than others. Some people are going to be on the ground crying with their head on the ground. They're going to be running around. They're going to be, you know, people are going to be panicking. And God is not going to show them pity. It's too late. It's done for. It's over. They're going to stand before God and they're going to be saying, please, I'll do whatever you want, whatever I have to do. You know what God's going to say? No. It's too late. He's going to say, he's, he's, you know, the Lord, because we are sinners, we feel like, you know, well, you, God, just show him mercy. Just please show him mercy. Just, just, I want this person to receive mercy. That's because you're not just. Let me say that again. That's because you don't understand justice. When God oftentimes you know, subscribe the penalty of like the death penalty in the Old Testament, he would say it repeatedly. Don't pity them. Right. Right. Don't pity them. Do you know why? Because he knows how mankind is. Right. Because you're a sinner. So you pity them. Right. But when they stand before God, he will be unfazed. Amen. He will be unfazed. He will not change. He gave them mercy already. He will not show them mercy and he will not feel bad for them. That's why he says in Matthew 7, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Do you know what those people are doing before him? Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? How do you think they're calm? No. Why are they saying Lord repeatedly? They're screaming out to him. They're bowing their knee out of fear is what they're doing. They're doing anything that they can do, just that they, that they think that may receive mercy. It's too late. Christian, the same thing can happen to you. The, the, the same thing can happen to you, not in order to go to hell, not stand before God and he sends you to hell, but the same thing can happen to you in this life. If you don't take heed to God's judgment, if you don't take heed to God's warnings, when the judgment comes oftentimes, it's already too late. You continue in these sins because you're not receiving the judgment, but do you know what happens sometimes? When the judgment comes, it's too late. And God's not coming back. God's not going to bring his hand back. I want you to see this repeatedly. You see, till there was no remedy there. I want you to go now to Isaiah 5. Isaiah chapter number 5. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 5. <clears throat> that was actually talked about when God brings his judgment down to the nation of Israel when they were disobedient. He sent, sent, sent prophets and preachers numerous times to warn them of their wickedness, and they didn't repent. They mocked the messengers of God. They misused the prophets, didn't they? They ridiculed them. They rejected God's word. And there came a time when there was no remedy. I want you to look at how God's punishment worked out. As I said, we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture now. Look at Isaiah chapter number 5. I want you to look at verse number 1, what takes place here. Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. And built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a, made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. This is a parable of, of Israel, and how they, he planted them there, and they were a beautiful nation, and they were righteous for a period of time, but then they brought forth wild grapes. This is their wickedness, this is their sin. And now all inhabitants of, of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between betwixt me and my vineyard. The vineyard, of course, as I said, is Israel, or Jerusalem, uh, Judah at this time. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you, 
what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I, all, <laughs> I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness, but behold a cry. Pay attention, verse 8. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an omer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabard and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Don't lose you know, the concept that's being put forth because you're not in their situation. What's, what goes on here, this is the judgment of God. They are repeatedly disobedient to God, and he sends, he sends a nation in to destroy the, this entire country. I want you to imagine that today. Let's say, you know, some massive nation, I guess China. It would be the judgment of God. China came in and destroyed and laid waste all the houses, killed millions of people. Think about this. People are dying from famines. People are famished. They're hungry. They have nothing. It's too late. That's exactly what he was talking about when he said, till there was no remedy. This is the judgment of God. This is the character of God. Right. He, he comes in and he has them just destroy. Just destroy the entire nation. How much sadness and sorrow. Read the book of Lamentations. I mean, he's depressed. He wants to die. This, it, this is reality. Put yourself in that, in that person's shoes. This is the judgment of God. It's not a joke. It can be misery. It can be heartache. It can be, you know, just the end of, 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 of happiness in your life as you know it. Keep reading. Let's look at, uh, let's actually, let's skip down a little bit. I want to I skip down to verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strong drink, men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossoms shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised, look at this again, despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Talking about the same things we read in 2 Chronicles. I want to focus on a statement here in verse number 25. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. Notice the exact pattern. They despised the word. And then remember it said in the other passage that we read, his anger arose. Same thing happens here. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them. That means he's punishing them. Now I want to focus on something at the end of this. Keep reading. And hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. So he has destroyed them, he has punished them, he has laid their cities waste, he has made their lives just miserable. And look what it says next. For all this, his anger is not turned away. Watch this. But his hand, talking about his punishment, his hand is stretched out still. People need to understand who the God of judgment is. People need to understand the God of the Bible, that he is not like us. He is not he does not have the human characteristics that we have. You know what he doesn't do? He is just and he is perfect. And after he starts to punish you, after he looks down and he sees your punishment and he has began to disperse your punishment, he is going to go forth with what you deserve, even after that. He's not going to look down and have mercy. What does it say? It said before, till there was no remedy. 
Till there was, there was nothing that they could do at that point. What happens here? He stretched out his arm. He smote the city. He laid their city's waste. People are dying of hunger. People, their, their wives, their spouse has died. Their husband has died, whatever it may be. Their children have died. And what does it say? That is the God of the Bible. It says, nevertheless. doesn't use the word nevertheless. It uses the word but here. But his hand is stretched out still. What does that mean? He's not pulling back. Why? Because he's not going to pity you. He knows what you deserve. You know what he's going to do? He's going to give you your judgment, no matter what. There's no remedy at this point. This, this should cause you to fear God. I, you know, the Bible, you know, repeatedly speaks of the importance of fearing God. And when you downplay the importance of fearing God, what you do is you cause people to live a life of sin. The person that's afraid of God and fears God is the person that's going to to do whatever they can do not to be on, you know, the receiving end of his judgment. You want to be in this situation? Do you want God? Do you want to be there when, when, when your country has been ravished and destroyed and then God's hand is still stretched out against you? When someone dies and they go to hell, think about this. In 40 trillion years, God's hand is still stretched out against them. It doesn't matter how long a time goes by. For all eternity, God's hand will still be stretched out, and he's never bringing it back. That is terrifying. You know what you should do? You should understand who God is, the God of judgment. I'm not going to make any bones about it. I'm preaching this sermon to cause you to fear God. I want you to understand who God is. I want you to understand God's judgment. We should fear the Lord. We need to know the severity of the punishments that he brings forth is another thing. Look at the problem. God will destroy your marriage. That happens all throughout the Bible. That is a punishment. God can destroy your marriage. God can... It, it, there are cases, and atheists want to mock these things. This is the God of the Bible. God will kill children sometimes and parents. God will kill you. These are real punishments of God. And you know what? If you have the attitude, well, I just don't believe that. Well, you not believing it doesn't make it not true. Right. That doesn't mean anything. Well, you, don't, you not liking it doesn't all of a sudden make God not who he is. You know why you don't believe it is because you don't like it. And you know why you don't like it? Because you're sinful yourself. And you're pitying these people in these situations. But God knows what people deserve. And you know what? Severe sins deserve severe consequences. Right. That's a fact. You want to do, you know, you, what you want is you want to be able to just steal a pencil and then go and commit adultery or whatever, some grievous, horrible sin, and then God give you the same punishment as when you stole a pencil. That's what you want. You want some small punishment for everything. That's not, the, you know, that's not just, and that's not the God of the Bible. Right. And as I showed the other day, all sins are not equal. Right. There's a sin unto death. There's a sin that's not unto death. There are great, the Bible talks about greater sins, great sins. The Bible gives different punishments for all sin. That is the fullest teaching in Christianity, and it's found nowhere in the Bible. All sin is not equal. And if you commit grievous sins, you will receive grievous punishments. And you know what? You may not receive them right away. But that doesn't mean they're not coming. It's coming for sure. The judgment is coming. You know what happens during that period of time? People say, where is the God of judgment? Why? Because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Just because you're not punished right away doesn't mean the punishment's not coming. It's coming. And the scary part about it is oftentimes when it, no, not oftentimes, when it comes, as far as the punishment that you're receiving, there's no going back. You're getting the punishment no matter what. And in some of these cases, you can even get to a point where in this life you receive no more opportunities. Saul, the Bible says that God was not going to answer Saul. It's clearly spoken of and explained in multiple different ways. God would not, Saul was a saved man on this earth. He was a disobedient Christian that kept disobeying prophets when they were sent to him. And what happened? He got to a point where God would not even respond to him. God would not answer him. God would not deal with him at all, period. He had gotten to a point where it's like, you know what? You've done so much. You only have 30 years left in your life. And at this point, your punishment is, is equal or just for that time, period of time. And you know what will happen? Sometimes God won't let, you, won't let you live during that time period. What will he do? He can take your life. And what happened with Saul? Because he's a just God. He knows what's deserved. Whether you deserve a punishment on this earth or your life taken completely. 
I want you to look at this again. We're gonna, I want you to read this a few times. Look at Isaiah 9. Through here, just flip over a couple of pages. Through here, we see repeatedly God's judgment upon Israel, God's judgment upon the nation of Israel or, or Judah at this time because there was a split. But Judah, and God is oppressing them and punishing them, and he keeps making this statement repeatedly over and over and over again. Look at verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 8. The Lord sent a word into Jacob, and he hath lighted upon Israel, and all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. Watch this. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Skip down to verse 18. For the wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. And they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. Listen to what's going on here. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand. And they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. <clears throat> this is God's punishment. God put them into a case where they are, so, they are so famished. They are so hungry. There is disease and pestilence to the point where people are literally eating the flesh off of their arm. This is the God of the Bible. This is God's punishment. Look at verse 21. How severe is that? Severe. Look at verse 21. Keep that in mind. Look at verse 21. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh. And they together shall be against Judah for all this. What you just read. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Is that what's preached about the God of the Bible oftentimes? Has he changed? No. The Bible tells you that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. The same God that issued these punishments in the Old Testament is the same God of today. He has not changed. His justice has not faded. It has not deteriorated one bit. Amen. He's just as just as he was then. That should cause you to fear God. That should bring about a fear in your life. Look at Isaiah 10, verse 1. <clears throat> Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that write grievousness which they have prescribed. To turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people. That widows may be their prey and that they may be robbed to the fatherless. And what will ye do in that day of visitation? That's the day of punishment or the day of wrath. And the desolation which shall come from far, to whom will ye flee or help? Remember, there's no remedy. And where will ye leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down <coughs> under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Go to Proverbs chapter number 29. Proverbs chapter number 29. <coughs> Proverbs chapter number 29. I want you to look at verse number 1. He that being often reproved. It means to be, reproved means to be corrected. It means to be warned about something. It means that you are sinning and someone comes to you and reproves you and says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You need to stop doing that. That's sinful. That's wicked. You need to get your life right. That's someone being reproved. So it says this. He that being often reproved. Notice they're receiving mercy. They're receiving warnings. Harden his, hardeneth his neck. So a hard, hardening your neck is a person that is, that is being stubborn. They are being hard-headed. It's a person that is not taking heed to the warning. They're not listening to the warning. They're continuing in their sin or in their disobedience. <clears throat> he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And then it says this, and that without remedy. What does that mean? <clears throat> There's no help. There's no going back. There's no other opportunity. <clears throat> It's the God of the Bible. It's the God of righteousness and the God of justice. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 6. See this again. Proverbs chapter number 6. Verse number 15. We need to hear about God's love. We need to hear about God's mercy. We need sermons on these things. But you know what? We shouldn't only focus on or become fixated with one characteristic about God or one attribute about God that just makes us feel good. 
I don't want to hear about God's wrath just because I don't like it. Well, it's still there and it's still true. And if you believe in the God of the Bible, the same Bible in which you get all of those statements about God is love, there are a lot of statements about God being wrath and God being just and God pouring out. You, this is not Burger King where you can have it your way, where you can pick out of here, I like this verse, I like that verse, I don't like that verse. It doesn't work like that. It's Genesis to Revelation. Amen. If this book's true, the whole book is true. Right. If the Bible is God's word, it's not just the parts you like, friend. It's all of it. Amen. Every last bit of it. If every person, think about what a mess. Every person just takes the Bible and picks and chooses what they want. No, there's a God that wrote these words. In this, they, a God that filled up men, holy men of God, that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and they pinned these words down. And these words are given by inspiration of God. And there are good examples in here that we should follow, but because, because God loves us, he also includes bad examples that he doesn't want you to follow. Because God loves you, he warns you about what could happen if you go down this path. God doesn't write those things in there to torment you and to scare you and to make you angry. He writes these things in there to say, don't go down this path. Don't do these things because I'm a just God and I have no choice when you cross this line. You commit these sins, you will be punished. And, there, and I'm glad that God tells me that there's a time in which there's no remedy. I, because, you know why? You know what that makes me think? You know what a smart person, instead of getting angry at God and getting angry at the preacher, the messenger of God, do you know what you should think? You should think, you know what? I'm glad he told me that. Now I'm going to be that much more careful that I don't put myself in the same position. Amen. I'm not going to be the one that hardens my neck. I'm not going to be the one that continues in sin just because I'm not being punished right away. I'm not going to be the one that you know just continually builds God's wrath up. Because that's what's happening there. God keeps giving them warnings and it says until the wrath of the Lord arose. So it, it's building up. It arose. That's what it said both times. Or, or, it, or it can't, I can't remember the other, or the other word. It used the word synonymous with a rose. But it's implying that it's, it's rising. It's building up. And then there's a point in which when it just comes down all of that at that one moment. And you know what happens? There's no, there's no turning back. You've already made the decisions. You've already made your bed. And you know what you have to do? You have to lie in it. There's no getting out of it. I'm glad God warns me about that. Right. You know why he does? Because he loves you. Because he's a God of mercy. A, 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 a sick, perverted, twist, got, twisted God would purposely not tell you so that he could continually get you to cross that line. He warns you because he loves you. So don't get mad at God because of, of these things. It should cause you to love God more because I want a God that's just. I don't want a God up there that's like me and that doesn't understand right from wrong. That's the reason why you feel pity for people when they do wrong. It truly is. Don't, that's why God tells you, don't pity them. Don't pity them. Why? Because this is what they deserve. This is what this is true justice, right? Love God because of his just, his just attributes, his righteousness. Love God more for that, that he's not changing. And that he will, you know, one day straighten out right and wrong. I don't want to stand for a judge that is just like on a fly, some guy's up there and crying, and he deserves this. And, Oh, he just lets this guy go. He lets that guy. I mean, does that sound fair? Sounds like a, it sounds ridiculous, like a mess, doesn't it? Where there's no system of who gets to go here, who gets to go. No, I, I'm glad that God is just. So we should love God for these things. Look at Proverbs chapter number six, verse fifteen. See this again. Therefore shall his calamity. That is severe, like uh, uh, problems. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. So at this point, there's no fixing it. Go to Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 20. Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 20. It says this, Wisdom crieth without. <coughs> Later on, we're, we're told that this, of course, wisdom is from God. It's God uh, warning people about God's law. It says in verse 20, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And scorners, it's people mocking, that sound familiar? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Remember reproof, correction, right? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, 
I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Does it look like God wants to bring punishment upon this person? I want you to notice something that you may not be familiar with this word and the concept. But if you look back in verse number 21, it says, She crieth in the chief place of concourse. What does that mean? What is a chief place? It's like a main place, isn't it? What's a concourse? It's where places meet together. Do you know the concept that's being put forth? This is being offered to everyone. That's what he's saying. Wisdom cries in the chief place of concourse. God wants to warn everyone. That's the point that he's saying right now. Where, where everyone passes by, wisdom is crying there so that everyone has an opportunity to hear. And that's why it says after that, it says in the openings of the gates, that's where everyone comes in at. The main places. And then it says in the city. That's where everyone is. That's the point of those statements. Let's get back down and go to verse 24. And then it says this. <coughs> Because I have called, and ye, refri re ye refuse, I have stretched out my hand, saying, I offered this wisdom to you, and no man regarded it. But ye have set it not all my counsel, and would, that means wanted, wo and would none of my reproof. This is the God of the Bible. I, will, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will, look at this, mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress, look at this severe pain that these people are in, distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Now, whether or not you like this or not, it is written in your Bible. It is in black and white, and I don't care whether you like it or not. I don't care if you disagree with it. If you believe in the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible made the statement and clearly says, I offered to you. He's loving. He's compassionate. I gave you an opportunity. I and you know what he said earlier that's very interesting? If you remember in the opening passage in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 16, he said that he sent his pro prophets because he had compassion. He said, I sent them B times. You know what that means? I sent them early. Why? Because he loves you. Early before the punishment came, Early so that you had an opportunity. But now look at what they want to do here. Look at verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Look what it says. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. What a scary place to be at in your life. When the God, the creator of this earth, the Lord of all, there is no one above him. Every single element, molecule, every person, every living thing is in subjection to this being. And he says, you are now at a point when you call upon me, I am not going to answer you. When you scream out and you beg for mercy, I'm not going to give it to you. I am not going to be phased. I'm not going to feel pity for you. And you know what? This is your fault. I gave you opportunities. And you know what? There's no remedy. There's no going back. You've already committed this sin. You've already been warned. You should have listened when you had the opportunity. But now, because the judgment has come, all of a sudden you want to call upon me. But you know what? I'm not going to answer. No more chances. No more opportunities. Listen to these words. No more hope. What a terrifying thought. What a terrifying thought. Underline these passages in the Bible. Don't ignore them. Amen. Till there was no remedy. It says, you're going to call upon me, and I'm not going to answer you. People can, will do horrible things. Horrible things. You know, a person could commit adultery on another person. Their wife or their husband, they commit adultery on, on, on their spouse. And then they continue to do so. And then they continue to do so. And then they, they don't realize what are going to be the consequences. But you know what? When the punishment comes, when the judgment comes, it's too late, buddy. You get no more opportunities. You know, you do, there's no remedy now. I warned you. I told you what was going to happen. I told you that I was going to punish you. 
I told you. You know what? It doesn't have to be adultery. It could be any, any other sin that you've committed or a person committed. But you know what? When the judgment, when the, you know, the time to beg for mercy, the time to reach out to God and to pray to God is not after you've been warned multiple times and then God's pouring out his judgment upon you. It's too late. That's the God of the Bible. Right. You need to not ignore these things. You need to know these things. You need to, you know, read these things continually and remind yourself about who God is. Amen. Amen. I want you to go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're going to end there. Sometimes a part of the punishment is being mocked and made fun of and an embarrassment. People are ashamed of their sin. And sometimes a part of your punishment is, is what oftentimes the Bible refers to as the reproach. That's what the Bible refers to. And it will be a mock, a mockery because of you had committed this sin. That sometimes is a part of God's judgment. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 16. God talking about destroying their land and what's going to be uh, happening at that time. He says to make their land desolate. That's what he's going to do to it. And a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passeth by thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. Saying they're going to mock and make fun of their hissing out of making fun of it. Jeremiah 19 verse 8 says, And I will make this city desolate and in hissing. Everyone that passeth by thereby shall be a, a, astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. Jeremiah chapter number 25. I, can't read it. I think it's verse 9. Jeremiah chapter number 25. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read this to you. Jeremiah chapter number 25 verse 9. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land. And against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and an hissing, and perpetual desolations. To a lot of people, the worst part of their punishment is the embarrassment of it. But you know what? Oftentimes when God punishes people in the Bible, a part of it is the embarrassment. That's a big part of it. You know what? Sin, you should be ashamed of your sin. You should be ashamed of your sin. You know, that's why Adam and Eve, after they had eaten of the fruit of the tree, what did they do? They were ashamed that they were naked. You should be ashamed of your sin. People, you know, people want to live their lives however they want. They want to continue in their sin. But then all of a sudden when the punishment comes, all of a sudden when God has to do what he has to do as God, to be the judge of all the earth, as he's referred to as many times. And he pours out his punishment. And because of the punishment, it becomes an open revelation to all the earth. That's a big part of it. And it's embarrassing. And it's shameful. It's the reproach of your sin. It's the reproach. So when you think about all that, you know, oftentimes when you think about maybe continuing in a sin, or maybe you've sinned, you've been warned about it, and it's a serious, grievous sin... All the things that are, that are in darkness are going to be brought to light one day. All the things that are, you know, that are hidden, they're going to be made manifest at one time. And a lot of times, a lot of times, God will punish you by making sure that everyone knows about your sin. And knows the embarrassing details about your sin, whatever it may be. That's a part of the reproach. I only went to a few passages because I didn't have much time to prepare the sermon this weekend and a nightmare, but there are many times in the Bible where the uh, the a part of the punishment is what did God say? I'm going to mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as a desolation and as a whirlwind, he says he's going to laugh at their calamity, didn't he? That's a part of the punishment. So think about that. This sin that you're committing, God's not maybe not punishing you now, but you will for sure receive a punishment for sure. And you know what? When you get that judgment, when that judgment comes down, it's scary because it's too late at that point. And you know what else? That sin that you're committing, it may, through God's hand, there might be a person, God uses mankind to do his dealings. Like Babylon right here, what we're seeing, that's a wicked nation. But you know what? He used that nation 
to fulfill his will, will into destroying the nation of Israel. <laughs> he can use a, a person you know, that's already planning on doing something wicked or something like that and reveal your sin to all the world as a part of your punishment, as a part of you know, the embarrassment of your reproach. You know what? You know what I tell my kids all the time? If people found out, find out about it or maybe a sin that maybe my child has committed that needs to be addressed head on, well, you know what? Maybe you should have been embarrassed about this embarrassed about it before you committed it and you wouldn't have done it in the first place. Maybe that's a thought that you need to have in your mind about some of the sins that you're contemplating committing in your life. Is this, how embarrassing would this be if all the world, you know, knew that I'm doing this? If all the world found out that I'm committing this sin? You, you, you know, everyone always wants to do the right thing when it's too late. You see this pattern? I mean, they're embarrassed when? When it's too late. They want mercy when? They want to do the right thing when? When it's too late. God is not a God of infinite opportunities. He's not. He's not. When someone goes to hell, they're there forever. It's a horribly sad thing, but it's the God of the Bible, okay? When they go to hell, they're there forever. You know what? As a Christian, you can get to a place even in your life where God will not answer you. He will not give you another opportunity. He's going to judge you. And you know what? You commit a severe sin, God's not going to punish you with a small punishment. He's going to punish you with a severe punishment. And it's, you know, the Bible talks about sometimes how when God says, I'm going to punish this nation, it's going to be such a bad punishment that when the people hear about it, it's going to make their ears what? Tingle. What's he trying to explain to you? This is going to be something that's going to shake you. That's going to, when you read through the Bible and the punishments that God brings upon people, they are sometimes severe. They are sometimes, the Bible calls God's punishment sometimes cruel. It does, many times. It talks about his punishments are coming in the, when the day of the Lord comes, the end of time. It says that his punishments are cruel. You need to know these things about the God of the Bible. You need to fear the God of the Bible. You need to, and because of this, you know what you should do? You should love him. I'm glad I have somebody to turn to that's not a sinner. And that, that, that knows true justice and judgment. And I have somewhere I can go and I want to know exactly what's right. I'm glad that God is who he is. I don't get mad at him. I'm glad that he warns me and he loves me. Look here at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 12. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, it explains earlier on in the chapter of uh, grievous sins that were committed, fornication being committed, idolatry, and it's a bad example of people in the Old Testament. It's a bad example. So this is going to tell us why God tells us about all those the, the sins that they had committed in the Old Testament. Why did God tell us about all these things? Look at verse 11 first. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. That means examples. For examples. And they are written for our admonition. That means for our learning. For our admonition or warning. That means the word admonition means to learn or to be warned by this. Our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12. So because of that is what wherefore means. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. When you read the sins that people commit in the Bible, the wickedness that they've done, you should never be in a place in your mind when you say, I'd never do that. Amen. What you should do rather is warn yourself against it. Amen. And take heed unto God's word. And you should take heed unto the examples that God has given. Take heed unto who God says he is. Don't, you know, close your ears and shut your ears like many people in the Bible do. You know what you need to do? You need to freely let those words sink down into your ears like Jesus says. Let them sink down into your ears and learn who God is. I want to know truly who God is. I don't want someone to stand up and lie to me about who God is. I don't want someone to stand up and just tell me what I want God to be. I want someone who loves me and wants to stand up and tell me who God is. And I'm glad that God told us who he is. And he did so because he's loving, because he's merciful. Let's love God for showing us compassion. Let's love God for at least giving us the warning. And you know what? You need to guard your heart. You need to go through this life not being prideful, but understanding that you could fall. And if you think you can't, you might. 
You think you can't, you probably will. Take example from the people in the Bible so that you don't have to be an example unto others. Because there are other people that have made committed grievous sins. And you know what? Their, the life, their life followed the same exact patterns. And once it's, too, once it's too late, it's too late. Keep that thought in your mind. Because that brings about the fear of the Lord in your heart. Till there was no remedy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We love you and we're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for your warnings, dear God. Uh, help us not to harden our hearts. Help us just to love you for who you are, dear God, and for what the Bible says, dear Lord. And help us, dear Lord, not to fall into these grievous sins, but to take heed, as I said, uh, and to uh, not to, to uh, become prideful and, and harden our heart and get angry about it, but to learn from other people's bad examples. Your Lord said that we don't have to learn on our own. We're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for Jesus dying on the cross for us. And we ask you to be with us and bless us all, dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.